Sadly, Mike's ill this evening and uh, I've had to stand in uh, to chair this evening's event. I'm Sue Donnelly and I'm the school's archivist. Um, tonight's talk, William Beveridge and Social Biology at the LSE, is uh, part of the LSE Library's uh, public events which are supporting its current exhibition, The Power of Influence, uh, which is uh, marks the centenary of William Beveridge's arrival here at LSE in 1919 as our fourth director. Um, and tonight, uh, Dr. Chris Rennick will be drawing on one of the themes of the exhibition in his talk tonight, which is namely the Department of Social Biology. Uh, Chris is a senior lecturer in modern history at the University of York, and uh, his first book, Britain, British Sociology's Lost Biological Roots, recovered the forgotten history of British sociologists' engagement with biology during the late 19th and early 20th century. And he's currently exploring how biologists and social scientists were brought together by a shared interest in topics such as intelligence, fertility, nutrition, and poverty, as well as by the uh, work of funding bodies like the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, if you're going to follow or work on Twitter, the hashtag for this evening is hashtag LSE Beverage 100. Um, Chris is going to talk to us and then we'll have a, a chance for people to ask questions after he's finished speaking. Okay, okay thanks a lot. To you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, Excellent. Uh, okay, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, and um, I want to begin um, with a scene um, it cast your mind back to graduation day at the LSE in 1937. And uh, you had been presented with, with uh, this man here, William Beveridge, uh, stood in front of the graduating students and the school as, as a whole. Um, Beveridge is obviously someone that we all know now as the, uh, as the, kind of the architect of the welfare state. Um, but at that point in time, um, he was still a publicly very famous figure, um, probably the world's leading expert on unemployment, uh, someone who had helped design this country's first uh, labour exchanges uh, and had worked as a civil servant in a variety of capacities and was generally a kind of famous uh, radio talking head. Um, now, at this point, in 1937, he'd been director of the LSE for uh, 18 years. Uh, it's approximately... 50% of the LSE's existence at that point in time. So someone who's a, a, you know, a hugely dominant uh, figure in the administration of the school. Uh, and he was a very important figure um, because he'd essentially helped transform the LSE to make it into an institution that we would recognise as the LSE that we know today. And uh, the context really for thinking about what, what this, this scene of graduation day is we're about two and a half months on from his resignation having been either accepted or forced, depending on which way you want to look at it. Uh, and so he's very much on the way out, and this is his final opportunity to, uh, to address the LSE, somebody he's worked for 18 years. Now, what he had to say on that day is perhaps not quite what you might expect, uh, but I imagine quite a few of his colleagues saw it coming. Um, over the course of about an hour, uh, he explained to everyone present just how poor he thought their work was. Um, he explained that, in general, social science was pretty shoddy, uh, and particularly uh, he had some work done by in the room. Uh, and he picked on a particular example. Um, John Maynard Keynes, he picked on at uh, one point in time. Uh, his new book, General Theory, uh, recently published, uh, being discussed widely, reviewed widely in the literary press. Uh, lots of positives, lots of negatives. Um, according to uh, Keynes, however, uh, according to Beveridge, however, he explained to the school, many who are not professional economists have read Keynes's book and have read the discussion of it by other economists. I do not see how they can avoid the conclusion that economics is not a science concerned with the phenomena, but a survival of medieval logic and that economists are persons who earn their livings by taking in one another's definitions for mangling. Now, Beveridge went on to kind of, you know, take apart what he saw as the problems uh, of economics as a science and as a whole, 
Um, he sort of explains, well, you know, the distinguishing mark of economic science, as is illustrated by this debate, is that it's a science in which verification of generalizations by reference to facts is neglected as irrelevant. And there's, there's more of this uh, in this lecture that, that, that he addresses to everybody there. So we need to ask ourselves, well, why was Beveridge so unhappy? What was it that had really uh, kind of got him? Well, one of the things that had, had got him and had wound him up was that he had very much fallen out with his professorial colleagues, uh, who, as I say, had more or less forced him out of his, the job as director after 18 years uh, shortly previously. But there was actually a bit more to it than, than that. Um, there was a kind of broader intellectual context that we might think of here. And he explained that, too, in terms that everybody present would have understood. What he explained was, uh, in trying to address why it was that, that, that he was so upset, he explained that, that, to his mind, to study in this school, the natural bases of the social sciences seemed valuable, not only in itself, but as bringing to us new examples of method alike in teaching and in research. And what really got him, as he explained, was that the future of that experiment was in doubt. And it's this experiment that I want to focus on in the rest of the talk today. And in particular on this, uh, this thing, this place, the Department of Social Biology, uh, which existed at the school from 1930 until 1937. And what I want to explain is that this Department of Social Biology, which was here for that short period of time, is a window onto a set of debates that are still very much with us, uh, a window onto a particular kind of intellectual culture and academic culture at the time in the interwar Britain. And in particular, it's a window onto a discussion that's currently ongoing about the place of uh, not just the relationship between biology and social science, but about the importance of eugenics to universities in this country and the role that they've played in, in uh, generating particular ideas and particular kinds of um, research. And what I want to suggest to you through the rest of the talk is that eugenics is an incredibly complex subject. It's always been a complex field, and it's very much embedded in a wide variety of ideas and a wide variety of research that's still very much with us uh, and isn't just something that we need to think about as being in some way uh, a, a part of the past. Now, to understand that, um, we need to, think, to understand the Department of Social Biology and its, its place in this institution. We need to think about uh, the, the, the history of the LSE and why it, why it is that it might have ended up here at that point in time. Um, one of the founding principles of the LSE, as I'm sure we all know, was to challenge the ancient universities in this country, and to do that not just institutionally, but to do that intellectually, to cultivate ideas and to cultivate ways of studying society that were marginalised in places like Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and even just down the road at UCL. And the idea of this was not just to advance the Fabian socialism that Sidney and Beatrice Webb uh, obviously were trying to, trying to promote through other means, but to effectively spread these ideas by training up politicians, business people, uh, administrators who could take these ideas out. And so it's for that reason that the LSE is the site of a number of firsts in British universities. Uh, something that I wrote about in my first book, or effectively my first book was about, um, was that the LSE was the site of the first chair of sociology in the UK, uh, the Martin White Chair of Sociology, uh, which uh, held by Mike Savage today, but held by many, many distinguished sociologists in this country uh, over the course of the last century. Now, how that uh, chair, basically what my first book was about, was how that chair came to be here and how it came to be awarded to the liberal political philosopher uh, L.T. Hobhouse. Um, and an interesting part of the story, uh, particularly in the context of things, the debate about decolonizing the curriculum, which is obviously what this talk uh, uh, fits into, uh, both here and more broadly in, in universities at the moment, um, is that once the idea of, an, uh, of establishing a chair of sociology had come up and uh, the idea of putting it here um, had been established, a wide variety of people suddenly became interested in the idea of 
being the first professor of sociology and of trying to attach their particular way of looking at uh, society to this idea of sociology. And there's lots of reasons for that, one of which is nobody was really quite sure what sociology actually was uh, at that point in time. Uh, as one commentator put it, it was a half Greek, half Latin compound to which it was impossible to attach any definite idea. Um, and so for that reason, you get a wide variety of people who are uh, very interested in, 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 in attaching their particular way of doing things to sociology. One of those people is Francis Galton, who was Darwin's cousin, uh, and uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, the founder of uh, eugenics in Britain. <coughs> and now, Galton was uh, somewhat ironically uh, childless, uh, and he was also a very rich man. And so he was on the lookout at the beginning of the 20th century for things to do with his money, uh, because he was, he was uh, getting on by that point in time. And he was looking to basically make a bequest to an institution that he thought would be able to promote eugenics, something that he spent the best part of half a century uh, developing it. And so the LSE and uh, the, the founding of sociology as an academic discipline here was something that he took a great deal of interest in. Now, for a variety of reasons that I'll agree with you, because I'm sure that you really want to go and read my book uh, to find out why that happened, um, he ends up not putting the money here. Instead, he goes down the road to UCL, uh, where he founds um, the uh, Gorton uh, Chair in Eugenics. Uh, and so there's a kind of interesting parallel universe in which if he'd left the money here, I'd be giving a uh, different talk that you would give at the UCL, but here, right? Uh, if that makes sense. Um, and so um, you know, the, 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 the debate that's happening down the road at UCL uh, in the context of their kind of thinking about their relationships with the eugenics is something that, that could have been based here, I suppose. Now, the point that I think it's worth reflecting on and thinking about as kind of seeding from that early history of, of the LSE uh, and the people who were involved in it and uh, getting from those founding, founding kind of um, moments of a chair of sociology and towards social biology is thinking about, well, okay, does that mean that because Galton goes down the road, that's, that, that means that biology and eugenics and these kinds of things aren't relevant for thinking about people at LSE? And the answer to that question is, is that, it, that they very much still are relevant. And an important person for thinking about <coughs> that, I think, is, or a, a you know, kind of window into that world, is Sidney Webb, one of the founders of the uh, LSE and a key Fabian. Now, we know, of course, that eugenics is popular in, in, in popular culture, but what we probably don't really talk about <coughs> more is the extent to which eugenics is an object of fascination in what we would broadly term progressive politics in the first half of the 20th century, and in particular for people who we would identify as being on the left, and people who would self-identify at the time as being on the left. Um, Webb is an interesting character in this sense because obviously he's someone who, who thinks quite a lot about poverty, about social structure, about the ways in which we can go about uh, uh, solving these things. And Webb was very open to engaging with questions about the biological dimensions of these problems. Uh, and we can see here, um, you know, what one example of that to do with eugenics and the poor law. Um, broadly speaking, the kinds of questions that come up in this are to do with the broad field of heredity, obviously. Um, and the issues that, that, that come up, the things that, that, that people are interested in is, to what extent does social policy either promote or facilitate what some people would describe as poor reproductive choices? And to what extent do those choices impact on the population as a whole? And there's obviously a whole variety of different questions that come up through that, um, <coughs> that come to be uh, under the heading of population science later in, in, in the 20th century, something that I'll talk about uh, later, but also which, which intersects with demography uh, as a field. Okay, and so the link here then is that Webb is the person who is instrumental in bringing beverage to the LSE in 1919. Now, by a lot of measures, uh, in fact, by almost any metric that you might want to choose, Beveridge's time here was hugely successful. Um, he brought in around £450,000 in uh, grants, 
Um, now, it's always very difficult to uh, translate those kinds of figures into modern equivalents. Uh, I ran it through the <coughs> National Archives converter. Uh, that told me that that was the equivalent of about 20 million pounds uh, in today's money. Um, perhaps uh, another way to think about it is the starting salary for an LSE professor at that time was £1,000 a year. And he brings in £450,000 in, in, in grants. Um, Beveridge uses that uh, in um, a lot of ways that will sound familiar today. He uses it on buildings. Um, he triples the, the footprint of the college. Uh, the library space, teaching space, all these kinds of things increase massively. Uh, there are whole new departments, uh, the Department of International Relations, for example. Um, but it also helps instigate what is in many ways a kind of first golden age of the LSE's research uh, culture. People like Arthur Bowley, uh, R.H. Tawney, uh, Lionel Robbins, all these people are here and publishing at this point in time and as a consequence largely of money that Beveridge brings in. Now, a lot of that money comes from a particular source and that is the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and, and subsidiaries thereof. Um, one estimate that I've seen says that approximately 25% of the money that the LSE spent from the early 1920s through to the mid-1930s was Rockefeller money. Um, so that's a huge percentage of, of what's going on here coming from one particular source. Now, within that money is a particular research grant application um, that came to interest me um, for the first time about 10 years ago. Um, it was controversial at the time, uh, still controversial now, uh, but it's something that Beveridge held incredibly dear to himself. This, this was something when you go through the archives at the Rockefeller Foundation and also here, this is something that Beveridge steers through himself. Uh, he, is, he is the person who writes the applications, negotiates with people at the Rockefeller Foundation about the money, um, and is the person who pushes it through to uh, approval in 1925, uh, with the money coming through in 1926, to the tune of $150,000. Uh, and that's uh, called the natural bases of social science. The thing that he talks about, uh, talks about in that graduation uh, address that, that I began with um, as being the thing that he considered to be a threat. So what, what was this? Um, well, you can see uh, the opening page of this application uh, over in the exhibition in the library uh, here. Um, Beveridge explains, he says, that it's, the idea is to complete the circle of the social sciences. A group of studies is required dealing with the natural bases of economics and politics with human material and its physical environment and forming a bridge between the natural and social sciences. What did that mean? Well, uh, to a certain extent, it meant bolstering some of the expertise that was already here. Uh, it meant uh, increasing the number of anthropologists, the number of people working in areas like public health. But he also thought that there, as he explained to the, the Rockefeller Foundation, that there was a whole area that the LSE didn't have that he wanted to uh, really embed into the institution, and that was social biology. Um, what is social biology at this point in time, according to William Beveridge? Well, he explains to the Rockefellers that the areas it covers are genetics, population, vital statistics, heredity, eugenics, and dysgenics. How, we, how is that going to work? Well, he, he says, what we're going to do, and what my idea is, is that we'll get a man of biological training, uh, and I think we can probably assume he was always on the lookout for a man, um, a man of biological training to learn economics and politics, and then, and only then, to employ himself to economic and social problems. There's a sense in which, and certainly I found this when I first started researching this topic, that we might find it surprising that William Beveridge, um, specifically, or someone like William Beveridge, um, might have an idea like this, might be so attached to an idea like this. Um, he is, after all, someone who's known as a pretty dour obsessive for statistics. Uh, obviously, someone who spent you know, many years working in and on labour exchanges. 
But what's clear when you start digging into Beveridge's writings um, is he has a really sustained interest in biology over the course of his life. Um, if you look in his autobiography, for example, he talks quite extensively about how he imagined himself having this almost alternative life where he'd become a biologist. He talks about how his great hero, intellectual heroes when he was at Oxford as a student were people like Darwin and uh, Huxley and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. And when thinking about the relationship between you know, that idea of Beveridge's kind of alternative life as a biologist or a natural scientist uh, and his identity as a social scientist, there are a few things that I think are important to consider when we think, well, what, what is it that he, he thought he was doing with this idea of getting a biologist to, to learn politics and, and economics? <coughs> well, one thing that he thought that he was doing was methodological. He thought that the social sciences had a huge amount to learn from the uh, natural scientists, uh, sciences. Why was that? Well, uh, a problem that I guess most social scientists would feel today, that the social sciences didn't necessarily command the same respect and therefore the same kind of funding as the natural sciences. And so for that reason, he thinks, well, if we can be a bit more like the natural sciences, then we might go some way towards... Uh, uh, earning that same kind of respect. And so the programme was in a lot of ways a way of trying to, I guess, what he would describe as kind of maturing the social sciences, methodologically speaking, uh, to make them more like uh, the so so uh, natural sciences. Okay, so what was the Department of Social Biology then, if that's how it was going to achieve? Well, uh, this slide is deliberately blank for a reason. And it's deliberately blank because um, I've spent about 10 years now looking for a photo of the Department of Social Biology, and there isn't one. Okay? Um, and this is really quite remarkable um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and one of these things is the Department of Social Biology is on is at number 19 Houghton Street. It occupies three floors of space, and in there are 1,500 animals, okay? experimental animals that are used for uh, uh, a range of different uh, uh, types of research. And the work that's being done there uh, is published in all kinds of uh, journals. I'll, I'll get onto some of the, the, the research we might think of as being social science research shortly. But um, the kinds of things that you, places that you could find it, uh, the British Journal of Experimental Biology, uh, the Biochemical Journal, American Naturalist. And uh, a little known fact is that the uh, best available pregnancy test in the world during the 20th century, or well, for most of the 20th century, sorry, was actually developed here at the LSA uh, in the interwar years in the Department of Social Biology, the Hogman test, uh, uh, which involved a toad. Um, now... Understandably, uh, given the definition which I'd kind of given previously about you know, the idea is that we're going to go and find a biologist uh, and get them to learn economics and uh, social science more generally, Beveridge put a huge amount of emphasis on finding the right person to come in and lead this new department uh, that, that he had founded. Um, and that person uh, was Lancelot Hogman, um, who didn't arrive for another four years until 1930. There was, there was a quite intensive, uh, well, we put it kind of, you know, job search these days, uh, is how we term it, person who we would bring in. Who was Hogman? Well, uh, he's one of the world's leading geneticists. Um, he was in South Africa at that point in time. Uh, and he was, he was brought, brought, uh, brought over. He, he's an Englishman, he was brought back over. Um, he would soon become more famous as, as a popular scientist writer, I think. Uh, he wrote books like Mathematics for the Millions. Um, but he is one of the world's leading geneticists. And what he's primarily known for is he's one of the most sophisticated thinkers when it comes to the relationship between organisms and their environment. Um, his big rival... Uh, is Ronald Fisher, uh, who's uh, uh, the person who, who demonstrates conclusively uh, that you can get causation from correlation uh, in the interwar years. Um, Hogburn, is, Fisher's career was basically devoted to being able to demonstrate that mathematically you could show 
uh, and isolate the, uh, the organism and show what was down to nature and what was down to nurture. Uh, Hogburn has the polar opposite view and is an incredibly sophisticated uh, thinker about what we would today term development. Uh, he thinks you can't separate out the different uh, factors and that there is in fact gene-environment interaction, which is a kind of separate third category rather than something that, that can be isolated in these kinds of ways. Now, Holborn has a reputation as being something of a, uh, a kind of beacon, I suppose, of anti-eugenic thought. And there's an extent to which that, that, that is obviously true about uh, a lot of eugenic thought and a lot of eugenic practice. Um, but I'm not entirely sure it actually adequately captures what it is that uh, Lancelot Hogburn was, was really getting at in his work. Um, he explains, for example, that he was not unsympathetic to eugenics as defined in general terms by Francis Galton, but did think the general tendency of eugenic propaganda had been to exaggerate and grossly exaggerate the applicability of genetic principles to the analysis of human society. And as he explained in his inaugural address as Professor of so uh, Social Biology uh, here at the LSE, um, the reason that he thought that was that the, the kind of crux of, of, of the eugenic thought that he had in mind as being targeted was the idea that biologists on their own could explain humans and human society and human problems. That's what he thought was problematic, the idea that but there was a, a kind of solely biological explanation for these things. And so in that sense, he's very much a member of what was known in the interwar period as the reform eugenics movement. This is an interesting movement because it's people who identify as being part of progressive politics, particularly people who identify as being on the left. And their idea was that eugenics was uh, a viable and potentially very valuable field, but it needed to be reconfigured both methodologically and also, they would argue, through better politics. So essentially, eugenics are being co-opted by the right wing, uh, and if we were to import some better left-wing values into eugenics, we would be able to achieve much better things. Now, Hogman and Beveridge got on, and it's important to stress that this is quite a remarkable thing. Uh, Hogman is not someone who gets on with people much. Um, the way I always explain this to people is that um, in every academic department, there is one person who makes meetings go on for longer than they really need to. And if you can't think who that person is, that's because that person is you. Um, Hogburn is very much that person. I was talking to Sue at the beginning about the size of his, his file, which is absolutely ginormous and, and you know, probably three times the size of people who have worked here for, for much, much longer. Um, now... Hogburn and, and Beveridge got on because Hogburn was obsessed with the idea of methodology as being the route to good science and the route towards good scientific ideas. Uh, he's a leading figure in the uh, movement for experimental biology, uh, an associate of people like Julian Huxley. Uh, and um, in that kind of proof that every science is always envious of some other science, uh, the, the, the aim of this is to make biology a bit more like physics um, and to kind of import the... The, the kind of methodological proof within that. And we can see that in um, many of his pronouncements about his job uh, at the LSE. Um, he says in his inaugural address, well, what's the, what's the point of social biology or the kind of social biology that he's going to practice here? He says it's about the sterilisation of the tools of social investigation. That's the primary uh, thing, or the first, first task. And as he puts it in, uh, in one of the memos to Beveridge in his um, HR file, it should be the aim of the Department of Social Biology to direct its attention to the examination of data which the interpretation involves no ambiguity. So if we think about the kinds of things that he has in mind there, if we think about things that you might be familiar with from eugenic propaganda in the first half of the 20th century, that, that idea of eugenics as a very kind of visual science where you can kind of tell what someone who is you know, mentally deficient, as it's put in the terms, you can tell that by sight, right, is the idea of eugenic science during the period. Hogman has no truck with any of that kind of stuff uh, and wants to argue that, that, you, that if we're going to have good science in these areas, then we need to move away from that kind of methodology and towards a whole other, more rigorous way of doing these things. Now, Hogburn had in mind a particular set of investigations, a particular kind of core set of work that, that he, he imagined doing when he came here. He was interested in 
population dynamics, population trends. Um, he's interested in intelligence. I think it's often difficult to, act, to appreciate the extent to which now that intelligence is a category that, that, that we, we have huge questions over, the extent to which progressive politics actually thought that this was a route um, towards achieving or a category that could help them achieve many of their aims, which is something I'll come to in a moment. Um, and also questions about social structure, so population trends and social structure. These are the things that he thinks are the starting points for uh, good social biology. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that the idea that they're the starting points for good social biology um, comes in a particular context in, uh, the interwar Britain and the early 20th century uh, Europe in particular. There are a particular set of concerns and uh, a particular set of worries, I suppose, in the first half of the 20th century, um, broadly get categorised under the heading the population problem. Um, there is a fear about population decline. Um, which seems to be stoked by statistics that show from the, the 1870s the birth rate has been going down in Britain. Um, and in fact, according to uh, the estimates of uh, Enid Charles, who worked in the Department of Social Biology, um, if the statistics were correct and if those trends carried on, there would be only 5 million people left in Britain in the year 2030. Um, this is, this is an estimate which, which, is, which is taken very seriously and seen to be very worrying. Why is that worrying? Well, because the second concern is what's, uh, what, what's called differential fertility. Um, the, the idea that there are different rates of reproduction between different social classes. Uh, and so, uh, the, the effectively, the, the middle class people are being outbred by the poor. And this creates the fear for some people that Britain is a dysgenic society. Um, and the way that, that, that it's put in some places is that, that Britain is a biological failure, okay, because it's unable to, to reproduce its social structure uh, and unable to reproduce itself overall numerically. Okay, so how, how does the work that was actually done here fit into those concerns? Uh, what does it look like? What is it that people are actually doing? Well, there are a large group of researchers working in this, across these three stories, doing a variety of different things. Um, there are experimental biologists. Uh, a lot of them are PhD students of Lancelot Hogden's who come here to, to do experiments on toads and things like that, which are to do with genetic linkage primarily. Um, but there are also an awful lot of demographers and population scientists working in there as well. Um, and a number of people, a number of upcoming people who are, I'll talk about shortly, pass through this department. Um, for example, David Glass, uh, who goes on to be, kind of be Martin White Professor of Sociology here after the war. Um, he works in the Department of Social Biology uh, as, a, as a population scientist. Now, these people all have their own projects. They're all, they're all working on, 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 on separate things. But at the same time, the idea was always that somehow kind of cohabitation would produce sort of organically better methodological uh, practices, but that these things could be brought together in large-scale projects. And something that turned out to be a kind of paradigmatic project for this department was research in an area that we would now call social mobility. Um, this was shown most clearly uh, in, this, in this edited collection, uh, as you see, edited by Lancelot Hogburn, uh, Political Arithmetic. Um, this, is, this is the book that, uh, really, really big book, lots, lots of chapters in it, individual studies that are brought together with a really kind of powerful uh, and lucid uh, introduction uh, by Lancelot Hogburn to explain what, what was going on. And there's all kinds of work in this that we would recognise today as, um, as being, um, I, I guess, you know, um, well, paradigmatic social science. Uh, David Glass has a study of class and university admissions in this book. Um, and the aim, um, I guess, for Hogburn is always to try and trace this back, 
these, these studies, to link these things back to that, that, that basic scientific research that he, he made his name on, and essentially to trace it back to research on genetics and intelligence. Uh, and in particular, the distribution of intelligence throughout the uh, population. This is probably done most starkly uh, in a study which the image on the right is from um, by uh, J.L. Gray and Pearl Mashinsky, uh, who did a lot of research on educational opportunity, uh, or what I guess we call educational opportunity today. What they did, and I noted this, that, that some of the uh, papers from this are also in the uh, exhibition in, in the library, um, was that they, they set out to carry out intelligence tests on school children, basically, was the, the, the basic uh, uh, data set that, the, that they used. And they carried out a little over 10,000 of them, um, which were done in, uh, for want of a better, uh, better way to phrase it, in state and privately educated children, basically, uh, with um, the aim to find out where ability was located and to be found in the population. So this is, this is where I was tr trying to suggest that we might think that intelligence is a questionable category these days and something that we were not necessarily interested in, uh, in, in using in, in this kind of way. They're very serious about this at this point in time and the idea that you can locate where raw intelligence is in a population at any given time that you can measure it. And what they then want to do, having uh, measured this, is try to figure out well, what happens to children who are able, who are intelligent, children of ability? Do they move on to the <coughs> next step in the educational ladder, which was, which was the metaphor that was being used at this point in time? Do they, do they move on? And the answer that's given in this study and, uh, and is, is glossed kind of nicely by Lancelot Hogman in the introduction is that, quantitatively speaking, there is much, much, much more ability and intelligence in the state sector and among working class children more generally than there is in the privately educated uh, sector, uh, to use slightly anachronistic terms. But what happens is that there are blockages in the system, primarily financial blockages, that mean that those able children do not continue in along the, up the educational ladder, primarily because you, you hit a point where you have to pay fees. And only a certain number of those children uh, get, get bursaries or scholarships that allows them to do so. And what Hogburn explains in his introduction is that from the perspective, his perspective, from the perspective of the Department of Social Biology, this is evidence that biology and social structure are not properly aligned. That what we see in Britain in the interwar years, he explains, is biological wastage, is what he calls it, uh, as a consequence of poor social structure, of not allowing ability and intelligence through. And this is, in many ways, and there are lots of different ways to look at this, this is, this is, this is a, what we might term a kind of massive human resources problem for a modern industrial society like, like Britain, which has all this ability which is effectively just going to waste but could be used in you know, jobs, occupations, professions to make Britain a better society. Now what I want to suggest is that stripped of some of its quite, you know, its biological grounding, some of the, the language that goes with it, this kind of work is pretty familiar. Um, it's pretty familiar to social science and it sounds pretty familiar to, in terms of some of the work that's still going on here, right? in terms of work on social mobility and, and social opportunities. So, what then happens? Well, um, political arithmetic is kind of the swan song of the Department of Social Biology, um, which to all intents and purposes closes in 1937, uh, although I think it still has an official existence for a bit longer than that. Um, why does it close? Well, um, the prime reason it closes is that Lancelot Hogburn gets fed up and goes somewhere else uh, in 1936. He goes to Aberdeen, where he gets a chair there. Um, what we can see uh, here is uh, an extract from a letter from um, Hogburn to Beveridge, 
uh, which is one of my favourite finds, I think, from here. Um, he explains, I'm sorry this hasn't come out particularly brilliantly here, um, but he explains that he is, if he's going to explain what it is that he's doing now that he's in Aberdeen, he's uh, busily salvaging my reputation as an experimental scientist after besmirching it by associating with economics and sociologists. Um, <laughs> Uh, is what he explains, uh, although on the, uh, the other page, the extract, which I particularly like, is where he, uh, he basically explains that um, he doesn't require an answer, he's tired tonight and know that I shall not may, uh, make this. Basically, he's been drinking, uh, <laughs> is the, uh, the explanation here. Uh, it's past 8 o'clock, he says something quite funny about the level of clarity that he gets after 8pm. Um, and so th there's a huge amount of animosity around this, uh, and the department gets wound down. Why, why does it get wound down? Well, there is uh, a question of money. The Rockefeller Foundation decides that it's not going to carry on uh, paying for this particular project. Um, they were wary uh, of the fact that, that the department hadn't produced, uh, I guess what in modern referable language we call usable outputs. Um, they were concerned that there was too much theory and not enough. They, they, they were, like a lot of research councils, they were interested in the idea that you would pay for something then you'd get something at the end of it that you could use. Uh, and they didn't feel that this, was, this, this kind, of, kind of stuff was uh, stuff that you could use. And so what they then plough their money into instead is molecular biology, uh, which is a field that the Rockefeller Foundation more or less kind of invents uh, in the late 1930s. Robert Kohler wrote a very good book about this. Um, but there are also a range of questions about feelings within the school about this department. Uh, difficult as it is to imagine now, Beveridge was a hugely unpopular figure by the mid-1930s. Um, as I, I said, uh, I've said a couple of times already, he is, he is effectively forced out um, at the, um, in the mid-1930s. Uh, there are a range of reasons to this. Um, like a lot of big kit science, social biology is expensive and there are economists and sociologists and anthropologists who feel hard done by it, the amount of money that's going into social biology, uh, things that they feel that they can do much more, more, more with. Um, so there's, there's resistance towards the department which is then amplified by Beveridge's uh, personal uh, lack of popularity. Um, there are accusations, in fact, that Beveridge was misusing funds and taking money that was meant for other sources and putting it into social biology to keep it afloat. Um, there's also strong opposition, in particular, from Friedrich Hayek. Um, Hayek, who came here in 1931, I think, um, is particularly resistant to it. Um, Hayek thinks that the department is simply socialism, which, as I'm sure many of you will know, uh, any whiff of socialism was just about enough for Hayek uh, to, to decide that, that, uh, he, that, that it had to go. Uh, he was particularly, particularly not, not happy with it. And then there's a range of other things which are really are at times very amusing to read in the archives with um, economists who are really quite upset about coming to work and finding toads outside their office and things like that because uh, they've escaped from the cages uh, in, in the social biology building. Um, so this kind of experience of bumping up against each other, which I think Beveridge thought was supposed to be a plus and would be something that would be beneficial, is actually something that, that, that in the end uh, actually comes to be seen as a negative. Now, there's a sense in which I think, and uh, as has um, often been done, when it comes to thinking about, well, how should we evaluate this, this experiment, this project? Um, you know, is it something that we can, we can write off as an experiment that simply ran its, its course? Um, well, I think that the level of animosity there was around it, and particularly when we, we, we think back to that graduation address from Beveridge and, and you know, the extent to which he used an occasion like that uh, to address this, um, indicates there's something more going on here, something that's worth thinking about. Something that... Hogman addressed in the rest of this letter, uh, which I think is, is something that, that uh, Beveridge shared as a concern too, was the idea, I think, that social biology was supposed to be beneficial for people at the school because they felt that social science was effectively something that had been divided up into different disciplines far too quickly. 
that there was still much that people working in different fields could learn from each other and there had been a kind of drive to disciplinary identity far too early. And what Hogman certainly thought, and to a less degree Beveridge thought, I think, is that social scientists didn't really understand what their subject matter was. And as a consequence, they were kind of fuzzy-headed, I suppose, about how it was that they were supposed to go about studying it. This, this is what I think uh, was Beveridge's opinion and Hogman's opinion. And uh, I think, quite understandably, the social scientists here didn't take too kindly to that suggestion. And so there, there, there is this debate, I think, that goes on around social biology that's, that's important for uh, thinking about it. But there are a whole other set of questions about thinking about, well, what's the legacy of this? Okay, so is this just a localised debate, both in terms of the LSE, but also in terms of Britain in the interwar years, uh, and about, uh, about how to do social science that, that, that we can understand as a time and a place? Well, there's a sense in which we, we can think, firstly, about um, kind of material legacies, both within the LSE and outside. So I mentioned David Glass as someone... Uh, who goes on to be a hugely important uh, sociologist after the Second World War. Um, he goes on to uh, lead the first large-scale proper study of social mobility in this country. Uh, he's one of the um, founding workers on the um, birth cohort studies, which are still running today. Um, and as, as I said, he's also, you know, his kind of standing is recognised by the fact that he becomes... Uh, Martin White, Professor of Sociology. We can also point to the fact that the uh, Population Investigation Committee, still here, um, was uh, brought to the LSE, or founded and, and located uh, here during this period, and David Glass was a member of the Population Investigation Committee. He's one of those people that provides a, a bridge between the two things. We can also think, well, who is it that replaces Beveridge as director of the LSE? Uh, it's Alexander Carr Saunders, um, who uh, annoyingly, uh, for someone who does research on this topic, I've discovered the Carr Saunders Halls of Residence, according to Google, is much more famous and important than Alexander Carr Saunders himself. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, who was Carr Saunders? Uh, well, he trained in zoology at Oxford. Uh, he went and uh, was a postgraduate student under Carl Pearson, who occupied that chair founded by Francis Galton at UCL. Uh, he wrote the Everyman book on eugenics. Uh, he is someone who embodies this, this, this early 20th century um, enthusiasm for trying to understand the link between biology and social science. But there are less obvious examples, I think, of thinking about, well, wh where, do, where does this thinking about biology and social science go. Um, Richard Titmus is someone, a uh, professor of social policy here after the, after the war, um, the high priest of the welfare state, as he was perhaps uh, apocryphally called, um, here in the 50s and 60s. Well, Titmus was the editor of the Eugenics Review during the Second World War um, and wrote frequently for him. Um, I mean, one example here, um, with, uh, Francois Lafitte who went on to be Professor of Social Policy at Birmingham, um, one of the founders of the British Pregnancy Advice Service as well. Um, the focus for his work, kind of continuing this tradition of thinking about, about um, society and social problems in the way that we'd seen in uh, social, the Department of Social Biology, it's always about poverty and biology, and uh, poverty and eugenics. Um, and his views on this subject were very much a... Uh, a continuation of, of the, the ideas that had found um, you know, an outlet in the Department of Social Biology because it's about the, the barriers to kind of people realising their potential. That's the framing um, for a lot of eugenics uh, writing during the war uh, there. And um, this really, really annoys a lot of members of the eugenics movement during the Second World War because this is the kind of stuff that, that, that Titmus uh, has published in the journal and really privileges above other things. And I think that's really the point that I want to, to, to kind of bring the talk to a close on. Um, and that's really this issue of thinking about, well, what, what is eugenics and what do we think about when we think about eugenics and what its consequences were 
uh, for academic research and I, I guess more generally for, for universities. Um, eugenics is a complex field. It's for the people of different political beliefs, different ideological alignments, different academic backgrounds, um, different ideas about, about what point of it is. And what I think we see in the Department of Social Biology and about some of these things that are connected with it and pass through LSE during this period and go on to be consequential in other ways is that there is a tradition of thinking about eugenics as being about the means of maximising human potential and human capital. That's a really important strand of the eugenics movement in the early 20th century. And it's a way of interpreting social injustices as also being biological injustices, I think, is the way in which, which people want, want, to, to want to look at it. And there's a sense in which I think we can often get caught up in the idea that eugenics is primarily the, the property and the interest of the political right wing, when in fact it interests the left wing just as much and is a set of ideas that goes on to be important to, uh, to people within that. And I, I think that it's important to think about the ways in which ideas that we would think of as being positive things, things like social mobility, for example, are cultivated within these intellectual spaces uh, during the first half of the 20th century. And so the question really for us to, to think about is, are the entanglements between biology, social biology, social mobility, are these things that we can explain, either, are they things that we can explain away? Are they things that are accidents of the period in which they first came about? Or is there perhaps something a bit more meaningful to them, something that tells us about the architecture of the ideas themselves and the shape that they take after the Second World War? And one of the things that I, I guess I'm most interested in when it comes to thinking about this is the extent to which when we, we look back and we think about the role of biology in shaping these, I, the, these ideas, to what extent do we, we kind of give biology and eugenics a free pass if the conclusion is one that we agree with? I think on that point I'll end. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, for a uh, really fascinating talk about uh, a part of LSE's history that I think many people don't know much about. Um, we have got some time now for questions uh, for Chris. Uh, we have a mic. Uh, this evening, uh, lecture is being recorded, so if you have a question, can I ask that you wait till uh, the microphone reaches you? Um, and also, can I ask that you try and keep your questions fairly, fairly short so that we can get as many in as possible? That would be great. Start, set the ball rolling. <laughs> Thank you for your <coughs> presentation. You, you, uh, yes, you mentioned that in the 1930s, beverage is not hugely unpopular. And then you said that he's in the Hayek another great figure in RSE, they, it seems that they don't like each other. Uh, could you give me more background of that? Because I study economics. Both of them are great figures, as, as I said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, I think the answer to that question um, has a lot to do with this idea of... Um, so, so his interest in social biology and, and issues around it Beveridge is one of these people who, during this period, is torn between the idea of, of a free market economy yeah. and one in which we might intervene a bit more in order to produce end products that we, we would want. Hayek is obviously someone who knows firmly which side of that debate he's on. And for that reason, he finds Beveridge a bit baffling because at one point Beveridge can can produce, I mean, he, you know, he edits uh, a, a book um, we, which numerous economists here contribute to do, a, a defense of free trade uh, and of liberal economics more generally. Um, but then he seems to drift off to other times into areas of what seemed like pretty full-scale planning and, and the idea that, um, you know, in many ways, 
social biology is something I think that's interesting because he sees it as being the biological equivalent of a kind of planned economy in a lot of ways. Um, and for that reason, Hayek not only disagrees with, with him ideologically, I think he comes to the conclusion he doesn't think beverage is very clever. Um, and just simply says that, that believes, sees what he sees as a lack of conviction, he sees as evidence of someone who just doesn't really know what they're talking about. Um, so I think that that really becomes the, the, the kind of crux of it. And then that, that rolls out. So when Hayek is one of those people who believes that he has brilliant projects, you know, prices and production and things like that, that aren't getting funded because beverage is channeling all the money into this. And, and Hayek goes off. There, there's a documented meeting between him and officers from the Rockefeller Foundation where he sits down and says, look, I have this great project and it's not happening because of this nonsense with toads over in um, Houghton Street. So it then spirals kind of out of control and, and this department becomes the real, like, um, you know, focus for it. And obviously, you know, Hayek is a hugely important person too, so the Rockefeller Foundation can't not listen to someone like that. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. I was just um, wondering if you could elaborate a bit more. You touched on the issue of uh, popul uh, depopulation in the uh, mid 1930s. So I was just wondering, like, how would what would be a social biological contribution to it, and how did the department see itself as being able to contribute? Because when you think of that problem, usually you think of sort of the economic implications of things like national security. So I was wondering like, how, uh, how did the Department of Social Biology get interested in that and how did they think they could contribute to a better understanding? Yeah, um, so the, so I guess broadly social security, welfare, these are issues that are, that, that draw, that connect up the, the sort of biological issue of, of depopulation with what we might think of as its, its consequences of social structure because you know, all of these people are broadly welfareist in their, their, their leanings, and there are, obviously, you have to be able to pay for a lot of that stuff. And so the idea of sustained, um, a population that can sustain itself in this sense, um, draws people into it. Um, there is a, I mean, I'm not really one for saying that there's just a purely kind of intellectual uh, explanation for things, but the idea of whether something is a biological failure or not is something that really interests people like Hogman because that's what um, his, his great rival, Donald Fisher, is working on at the time. It's the question of um, this differential, uh, what's called a differential paradox, a Darwinian paradox. How is it that if there's survival of the fittest, how is it that notionally the, the, the least fit members of society are reproducing more? How is that that, that can be going on? Um, Fisher's argument is that um, basically infertility is a is more or less inherited because it's a, it's a strategy for success because if you want to be successful in a profession, right, you don't have children when you're 18. Uh, you, you put put those things off, and so 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 Fisher basically argues that relative infertility is a strategy for social success. And therefore, it's actually something that what starts off as being a choice, but then becomes biologically inherited. So people who are relatively infertile tend to survive for longer. Uh, and and reducing this becomes a problem. This then becomes a... The, re, the way this, this feeds into the social uh, security discussion is what does this mean for questions like uh, well, what we call child benefit now, but family allowances? Um, as I was talking to Sue about at the beginning, family allowances are something that the LSE pioneers in the interwar years under Beveridge's uh, um, directorship. That's not to say they're just you know they're entirely about th this sort of thing, but there is a school of progressive thought during this period that says that social security and welfare payments, yes, they are things for poor people, but they are also things that we need to really think about when it comes to middle class people and encouraging them to have bigger families. And so it feeds into all these kinds of other debates in, in, in that sense about how is it that we 
manage what is essentially a large-scale human resources problem, I, I think, yeah. Uh, dear Chris, thank you very much for the interesting talk, especially as the head of the LSE Neuroscience and Bioethics Society. I found it really interesting to learn about the history of eugenics, which I didn't know had like a left-wing spin to it as well. Um, I always derided it as the bastardization of Darwin's science. Um, but my question is, where would you mark the end of social biology at the LSE? Oh, good question. Um, okay, so it depends on what you like, whether you want to call it like a is social biology just like a it's like a thing, like a discipline that has to exist in a coherent single place, right, in a department, or is it something that continues to exist because um, what was previously collected in one place becomes dispersed into other areas. Certainly. Like, yeah. even in our department, we had a professor <coughs> who made, like, in management, we had someone who made, like, really awful scientific studies on why black women are less attractive or right. something. It was ridiculous, yeah. but it's still going on. Yeah, um, but I, I think that the, um, I guess to link that back to what I was saying at the, the end, you know, kind of critical studies of this stuff also count as, as belonging to that, that field. So, you know, you can think about people like Nicholas Rose, for example, who were here up until uh, you know, fairly uh, recently. Um, I think he was also in the Martin Weber Professor of Sociology, um, who, you know, critical thinking about, about bioscience. Um, there were plenty of evolutionary psychologists here at one point in time, and I'm sure there still are. Um, so... This, this stuff, I would suggest, never goes away. It's just that it becomes part of different disciplines and in different departments rather than being concentrated in one, one place. But then my follow-up question would yes. be, could the Department of Health Policy yes. and the interaction with the London School of Hygiene and... Um, yeah, tropical medicine. Yeah. Tropical medicine, thank you. Could that be seen as a continuation then, or is that something new? I, mean, I don't want to go... I mean... I have to say, I'm not that up to what's going on in health science and policy here at the moment. I, I, I wouldn't want to say anything on a recording uh, <laughs> that, that will then uh, make it into the outside, outside world. Um, I, I, th I think that th there, is a, there, is, there is a particular quantitative tradition for thinking about these things that comes out of social biology in the interwar years in particular, which is particularly strong and has always been strong at the LSE. Um, and, I mean, to take it back to the beginning of your question, there's a sense in which there's a particular part of the political spectrum that doesn't really want to talk about this, the origins of this stuff. For pretty good reasons. Um, but, but nevertheless, it's important to recognise how there is such a broad spectrum of ideological and political belief that goes that, that goes into eugenics during this period um, and you know thinking about where it goes and what we evaluate that is pretty important I think hi thank you for your talk um, I was wondering what are the ways in which beverage try to convince up-and-coming social science students to go to this new program? Because I imagine that the perception must have been that this was a very new and potentially controversial type of thing. So I was wondering if you had to campaign almost to get students to join this, or was there already a cohort of like very f passionate students who wanted to do this kind of work at the time? So um, m most of the... Um, so, so effectively for someone like Hogman, most of it is happening at what we would, at a graduate level. It's people who have a refined, high-level interest in this stuff who come here. However, Beveridge's big idea is that all undergraduates should have to do a course in the lab with Hogman, right? Um, that, that, I, mean, there's, I mean, aside from all the resourcing problems that go with something like that, that is met with quite a lot of resistance from people who, both both students and also, you know, staff here, 
who do not understand what the point is. Like, why are you dressing up in a white lab coat and going to, you know, a laboratory to, to learn about these kinds of things? Um, not many people, not many students do that. But Beveridge's idea is that that is what should happen. That, that his dream is that every, every student at the LSE will do a module or course in the Department of Social Biology experimenting on things because that will, that will inform the practice in the social sciences better. Um, doesn't quite work out like that, but that is the dream for Beveridge. Um, but, but practically speaking, we're, we're, it is something that exists mainly at the graduate level. Thank you. I mean, I'm really interested in the you know, topic. It's like the, at the very beginning, you, you said that RSE was created to challenge the Asian university. And the lecture was <coughs> held here. Of course, we are, I'd like to discuss with you that. Yes. <coughs> and the, the first, after the war, the first, I mean, the government, uh, in a sense, is based on a favorite model. And uh, as I know that, uh, I think the Eden's part, in Eden's government, I think in the 1960s and 70s, and uh, his policy was uh, <coughs> planned by a professor from RSE. Can I say in that sense, what you said that the RSE was created to challenge the Asian university, and, and which, which means that RSE have done a great job in that sense, yes or no, thank you. I mean that like, you said that it challenged the Asian <coughs> university. And then, did, did, do you feel that RSC has done a good job? And then I'd like to have your opinion about the RSC's job. Thank you. Um, well, does the, okay. So the LSE sets out to expand the uh, realm of things that are considered important for. Uh, people working in, in government to know about, right? So the idea of the ancient universities being that you have kind of classics and things like that, right? The LSE is not single-handedly responsible for changing that, but is, is incredibly important in changing uh, the, the idea that, uh, that there are, you know, the social sciences are important for people to know about. And like social sciences beyond just economics, which are obviously things that... that, that that are studied uh, uh, elsewhere at that point in time. Is it, is it successful? Well, um, Hayek, for example, one of the things that he identifies as being, um, you know, so the huge amount of literature that's been written about neoliberalism and about the development of neoliberalism in the mid 20th century and what happens. One of the, the, the key points about that is that Hayek and others they are incredibly annoyed because they believe that places like the LSE have infiltrated public life by, by basically educating and implanting ideas and ways of thinking in people's minds who have then gone out into government and, and public life more generally and that effectively socialism has found its way into, into, into life via those means. And what Hayek identifies is that that didn't happen overnight. It's something that happened over you know, 50, 60, 70 years through places like this, he thinks. Um, and that the people of his beliefs need their own alternative ways of doing that. And that organisations like the Mont Pelerin Society and things like that are a way to, to trying to address what he sees as being the... Um, uh, the undue influence that, 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 that institutions like the LSE have on public life uh, in, in the mid and late 20th century. So I tend to think that the LSE is being pretty successful at that. Um, does it mean that, they, that the LSE has achieved precisely what its, what its founders set out to do? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but it's certainly been successful. I mean, we're all still here, the lights are still on, right? So, um, 
uh, and it's a much bigger institution than it was in that sense. So I, I suggest it's been hugely successful. And of course, you know, we're all here talking about it now. I almost forget the name of the higher. The, 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 the example I give you is about the, the labor government. If we take Hayek in the account, I think the central government was influenced by Hayek very much, right? In that sense, the, almost, um, I mean, the, at least in the past 50 or longer years, British government was influenced by IOC's idea very much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, yeah, Hayek is, is as much a part of this story as, as any of the, the left-leaning people, and he's hugely important to that too, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And Robbins as well, right? So, uh. I just have a, a quick question, because um, thinking about this, this, this story and listening to you, there's very much a sense of um, Hogburn and Beveridge against the world, almost. Um, is that a true story? image where there are other people here at LSE who did support this idea or was it very much you know just beverage driving it through um, so I think that there are plenty of people who are prepared to give beverage a kind of a hearing about this because I mean having having said that beverage is a hugely unpopular figure there are obviously a lot of people here who owe a lot to him. Um, Robbins being an obvious example of someone who worked for Beveridge and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff, um, who, who <coughs> want to give him a go, but cannot for the life of them understand what it is that he's trying to do. And so I think that um, it isn't... That there's, kind of, there's, generally speaking confusion but the sense in which this person is a kind of crack administrator who's bringing a lot of money and he seems to be doing a, lot, a really good job in lots of other senses so why not let him do this I mean if the Rockefeller Foundation want to pay for it why not um, and but that 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 has definitely all gone mm. by the mid 1930s but the one person who <coughs> throughout it all sticks with beverage and talks about it afterwards is David Glass who in the introduction to the big social mobility survey says, I, yeah, I owe this all to the Department of Social Biology and, uh, and to Lancelot Hogman in particular. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be who I am, where I am, if it wasn't for that. And it's a great shame that that is now closed. So, so there are people who, you know, again, are connected with it and see it as being, being valuable. But by the mid-1930s, you, you're not going to find too many people who want to stand up for this. In that case, even High Club, when he was teaching <coughs> LSE, his, I mean, his relation with other people not so good. In that case, the, the what sorry? In the High Club, not, not bigger. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that I read some books about the, when he was working at RSE. Yeah. yeah he's a good big. His, his book is very popular. Yeah. And, uh, as for the personal relation with other faculties, is not that good. Is that the case or not? Hayek, by this point in time, gets on... Well, there's an issue with Hayek in that he's brought, he's brought to the school, right? He's, Robbins is, is the person he brings in here in the early 1930s. And there are, there are question marks about Hayek to start with, which are de kind of derived from the fact that when he first comes here, his English isn't that great, and so... Um, there are lots of people. He, he kind of gives the, you know, the equivalent of a job talk, right? And lots of people claim not to really be able to understand what the hell he's talking about. But Robin says, no, this guy is, he is, he is, he is the future, right? You know, this, he's really... So he's kind of brought, brought here um, for that reason. But by the mid-1930s, he is a, a quite influential figure within the school um, and is, is uh, well... I mean, I mean, not that it's saying much, but he's certainly more popular than Beveridge by the mid-1930s. Um, so, um, so he's someone that their kind of popularity, relative popularity changes during this period. Yeah. Okay, this one. Can you just hold on a second until we get the mic to you? Um, so Beveridge was really influential in the welfare, the creation of the welfare state and the beverage report that came out after the war. And I just wondered kind of to what extent 
these kind of social biology views, like how that was reflected in that, or if the views had changed? And yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so I wrote a second book, which <laughs> about the welfare state, in which I talk about this. You should go and buy it. It's, it's underappreciated. Um, <laughs> it's um, so there's a, there's a kind of nice vignette, right, which you can use to 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 to, to illustrate this point, and that's that. Um, when the uh, beverage report is discussed for the first time uh, in Parliament in uh, 1942, um, uh, sorry, early 43, um, w what does what does beverage do? Well, he, he goes to Parliament to, to, to listen to this, uh, but about an hour into the debate, he gets up and he leaves to go to give a talk at the Eugenic Society. Um, what, what does he go to talk about? He goes to give, give a talk which is called The Eugenic Implications of Family Allowances. Right? So the point that I'm making there is, and it's always important to say that, that no, none of thinking about these links is, is to kind of, kind of either naively or crudely say that this person or that person is some kind of raging eugenicist. It's about saying there is this context which perhaps we don't often use all that often now for thinking about these things, that people like Beveridge, they thought about. They thought about, well, actually, there's this, there's this dimension to these kind of social security policies that we, we really need to think about. I mean, of course, his argument is that there aren't any bad eugenic implications of family allowances, and therefore, you know, it's okay. Um, but he, he continues to... To, to think about these things in a context which is informed by that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it is undoubtedly the case that after the Second World War, um, people think about that context in very different ways for very obvious reasons um, and are, are reticent to, to, to necessarily use the same language that they used before um, for talking about it. But it, it is nevertheless there. Um, and Beveridge, you know, in, when he writes about the Department of Social Biology in his autobiography, um, he, he talks extensively in there about how what disappoints him most about the department closing is that when you look at what happened, you know, in Germany and other places, and not, not just in Germany, in the US as well, the kinds of terrible things that were done in the name of eugenics <laughs> and, and for social policy, that that actually there's there's a whole sphere of socio-biological research that is important for demonstrating why those th ideas were misfounded and bad. And, you know, he writes extensively about that in his autobiography. So, you know, again, that point about there being kind of critical approaches to this as well as not, it's not just all cheerleading, I think is the point, yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering a bit if you could say a few things about the way the department was set up and whether this had anything to do with the Galton Laboratory and the Biometric Laboratory that Carl Pearson had set up at UCL and to what extent this was used as an inspiration as or something that should be avoided. And I can't remember whether you actually mentioned anything about them having set up journals uh, because we know that Carl Pearson effectively had set up a publishing business really yeah. <laughs> at the Galton Laboratory. So I was yeah. wondering if you could say a few things about how they see each other and whether they were, you know, there was any kind of, you know, working together or... Um, I mean, basically, no. Um, they, they don't work together. I mean, I'm, in terms of thinking about why that might be. Um, and actually, you can, you can see this now through the, the way in which UCL is now talking about its own history with, 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 with eugenics and with, with Pearson and with, with that laboratory. Eugenics at UCL is always focused on race, which is not true of this stuff. Um, and for that reason, there are they're, they're talking about really different aspects of, of the problem. Now, of course, they obviously know about each other's work, um, and there are various kind of social surveys and things that come out of, of UCL, and particularly stuff to do with um, differential fertility and things like that, which provide the raw materials for some of the, the, the research that 
that, that's done there. But it's, it's a quite different setup. And, and also, I think we probably need to appreciate, although this is a slightly niche point from the history, Pearson establishes that, you know, that publishing business and the journals and things in order to promote a very specific view of biology and of evolution more generally, which by this point has kind of disintegrated and is no longer seen as being, you know, an either, it's either genetics or it's Darwinian, you know, biometrics. So, so those things have collapsed a bit and so you, don't, you just don't see that same set of distinctions in what's going on here as you do at UCL, which has a specific identity built around the focus on race, but also those, those method, methodological things. Um, and of course, as a consequence, their politics are just really quite different. Um, and, and, and Hogben is just not the kind of character who's going to put up with... Um, you know, someone, someone who leaves South Africa because of the racial politics that, that, that he experiences there is just not going to put up with Pearson um, and, and uh, people associated with him. So, so that, that's important as well, I think. One final question here, then. Thank you so much for coming and delivering the talk. It was quite insightful for me. I am, uh, I'm, new, I'm new to social sciences. I studied the engineering before. And uh, in the past two months, I've been fascinated by just uh, the, the kind of uh, discussions that happen around the university, right? And I think in the Q&A session in the beginning, you mentioned that I think William Beveridge, his, uh, his vision was for social scientists to be informed t about biology as well, right? Or the physical science. Yeah. I was, I was thinking today if there was an opportunity for let's say LSE students to do at least one module, nothing related to eugenics, but in general, one module from physical sciences, wouldn't it actually help to look at problems from a different perspective? Interesting. Um, so the, the kind of niche hipster answer to your question <laughs> is, is that epigenetics is the thing that all social scientists should know about. Epigenetics. Epigenetics, right? How the environment basically effectively switches genes on and off. Uh, there's, there's, a, um, there, there's a whole sort of tranche of new kind of social, what, we, what is social biology basically, that, that is dedicated to the idea that this is the, the arena in which biology and social science can now meet as equals. Okay? Because mm -hmm. if it's about genes being turned on and off, by the environment, and this is putting it in very crude terms, but that's, that, that, that's the general gist of it. This is where the social scientist has knowledge that is of equal importance to what a biologist might tell you about the gene. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are plenty of people around who, who see that as being the new sphere where, where biology and social science kind of would come together. Uh, you know, maybe in the kind of way that Beveridge had, had imagined there. Um, I mean, methodologically, which was Beveridge's other concern, it's the, the kind of the same old debates, right, about, you know, that come back to whether you're a positivist or not. Um, so, yeah, so that, that would be my, my, my kind of answer to that question. Thank you. Thanks to um, Chris this evening for an interesting discussion and talk and to all of you for contributing. If this has whetted your appetite for finding out more about William Beveridge, uh, we have a talk next week on the 11th by his biographer, uh, Josie Harris. And then on the 26th of November, there'll be a talk by Professor Mick Cox of the school here about another big uh, idea of beverages, uh, which was supporting some of the refu academic refugees leaving Europe uh, in the 1930s, and that's called The Kindness of Strangers, Hitler. Hitler, beverage... And the LSE. <laughs> okay. You can uh, some interesting and find out some interesting ways in which they managed to fund it. <laughs> so thank you all once again, and let's thank Chris again for his talk.